Hello, my name is Brenda Boschella, and I'm a reading specialist for Cuyahoga Community College. I'm here today to talk briefly with you about some keys for reading your history textbook. Now some of these things may be keys that you have practiced before, things that you typically do when you read. Others may be new to you, some new things for you to consider. I'm going to be sharing seven things with you that I hope will help you as you read through your history textbook during this course. Several of these keys actually come from history instructors themselves. You might call them sort of the disciplinary insiders. And who doesn't like the inside scoop, right? So let's get started. The first key is to think about the big picture. Now history isn't just about learning facts and dates. It's about understanding how and why things happened. Remember the WH questions that you learned in school? Think about those while you're reading. The first one I've included is who. So while you're reading your history textbook, you need to be thinking about who are the important people during the time period in which you're reading. Don't get bogged down typically with just the facts and dates at the expense of this big picture. So keep these WH things in mind. What about how? You might ask yourself, how is this event that I'm reading about situated in respect to other events that I've learned about in this course or in other classes? And the last question you'll always want to keep in mind is the why question. Why would this event even be important? And how would it relate to these other events? If you keep questions like these in your mind, it helps give you a framework on which you can then attach the dates and the names and the things that you need to memorize for your course. Remembering them this way gives you a meaningful context. So the first key, the big picture. The second key you'll want to consider is information overload. Now this might sound a little bit um, contradictory because you know you're going to be reading a lot of different material. But history readings often give you more information than you actually need to consider. Now think about it. The author is going to include details to make their case more persuasive or memorable. Just because they've included all these details doesn't mean that it's something you have to memorize. To avoid this information overload, I'm going to encourage you to take good notes. And I want to share a couple slides with you specifically about this note taking that I want you to do. Now you may have a style of note taking that you already use, one that you're familiar with and one that really works for you. And if that's the case, I encourage you to just keep using that style. If you're someone who's always struggled with how to take notes, I want to suggest a style today that might be useful for you. And maybe you could try it out a few times during the course of the semester and see if it is really helpful. So the first thing I want you to think about is take a look at this table that I'm going to share with you. It's sort of justifying why you even want to take notes. Now I recognize that you're in an online course, but I know that your instructors are going to be sharing lectures with you. Look at the statistics on this table. It talks about the amount of time that passes from the time you hear a lecture, um, and then how much of the information that we're able to just recall without taking notes or anything. I found this to be quite staggering. To think about just 20 minutes post-lecture, we've already forgotten almost half of what we just heard. Now a typical semester runs anywhere from 75 to 80 days in length. So look at that final detail there. If we did not take notes while we were reading and listening to lectures during the course of a semester, by the end of that time, that 16 weeks or 14 weeks, we would have forgotten nearly three quarters of what we heard about. So to avoid this, I really want to urge you to take notes. And this is the style that I'm recommending if you are looking for one. It's simply called Cornell Notes. And you're just looking at a typical piece of notebook paper. Notice how the paper is divided. The, the left-hand side of the paper is set aside for you to write down key points. These key points would be things like the bullet points off of your professor's PowerPoint, the dark titled headings in your textbook that start each new section. Um, it might be a person's name, if there's a great deal of information shared about that person historically. Or it might be a date or a battle, if you're reading about a particular war. That would be your key points. The notes area is where you're writing down more of that detailed information. I urge you that while you're listening to a lecture, write down the key point that your instructor puts up on the PowerPoint. But then while he continues to talk, take down the notes that he's sharing with you in the notes section. Leave spaces between your lines as you're writing so that if you go back to reread your textbook and you find out a little bit more information about that, you can fill it in. 
In the bottom section, you see, says summary. And this is really useful because I want you, at the end of each note-taking session or at the end of each lecture, to go back and simply, in a few key words or sentences, summarize what you found interesting or important during that lecture. This is going to give you three specific ways to review. You could, at the, course of, uh, the end of the course or at the time for the test or the quiz, you could go back to this page and simply cover up the notes with another sheet of paper or with your hand and just go through the key points, going down each one, looking at it, and sort of quizzing yourself, rehearsing what would be the important information. You may do the opposite, cover up those key points and just read the text that you have written and then try to determine what was the key point or event or name or date that goes along with that. You might also simply go back each day at the end and reread the summaries that you have written. You've provided yourself three ways that you can go back and review this information quickly and easily. So much easier than leafing back through a textbook page by page by page trying to find important information. So again, to avoid that information overload, which was one of our keys for reading history, good note-taking skills are really important. Try this Cornell style, and if it works for you, stick with it. If you need to adapt it or alter it to work for you, do that. But make it useful, and I promise you it will be a very helpful thing during the course of this semester. The third key that we're going to look at today simply says intelligent reading. You might have heard this called active reading before in your um, educational history. And before I show you the points on active reading, let me just share with you a little bit about this. I want you to think about active reading almost as if um, you were at a sporting event. I think that's the best analogy that I can share with you. If you go to a sporting event, and since I'm here in Cleveland, and we are now um, thinking about LeBron James coming back and playing for the Cavaliers, imagine the crowd in the queue where our Cleveland Cavaliers play. Imagine the crowd on the first night of the first game, right, when LeBron comes out on the floor. I promise you that nearly every fan in the, in the queue is going to be on their feet, perhaps screaming, yelling, pointing, waving things. They'll probably be wearing Cavalier shirts or LeBron's number. There's going to be a great deal of excitement in the crowd. Now think about it. The actual winning of a game does not happen in the stands, right? It happens on the floor. And yet the fans are going to be actively engaged in everything that goes on down on the floor of the queue that night. As a reader, all the information is contained in the text, but you need to be that active participant. In a sense, like the, the fans at the queue, on your feet, yelling, screaming, you need to be doing some things while you're reading, being actively engaged, that are going to help you make sense of the text. And these are the things that I'm going to encourage you to do. The first one is to familiarize yourself with the textbook. Now, this sounds so simple and so direct, and yet I am always amazed at students that fail to take the time to just figure out what's in the book. I've had math students come to me before, halfway through the semester, not even realizing that all the odd answers are in the back of the book. So take some time to look through your textbook. Look at the table of contents. See what, what is included there, how your book is divided up. I even encourage students to read the letter from the author, the person who wrote the book, to see where he or she or they are coming from and what their take on history is. Look at each chapter. See if it begins with objectives that are important points that you need to know about while you're reading. See if there's a list of vocabulary words. See if there's questions at the end of the chapter. And certainly look at the back of the book. Look at the glossary and the lists of important names and dates that are included there. Familiarize yourself with your textbook. The second thing is to also take the time to preview each chapter before you read. And you'll notice I have the word before highlighted because I'm going to talk specifically about these things that you do before you read, some things that you will do during reading, and some things you can do after reading. So previewing the chapter before reading is important. You might look at, number one, how long is it? Um, so that you have a sense of how long you might need to set aside for reading. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. You might also want to determine if there are charts and graphs and tables, maybe some things you want to look at before you even start reading the text. And this preview is a good time to do this. Also during the preview, I encourage you to create some questions to guide your reading. This can be as simple as using questions that are already written in your textbook, if your author has done this, or creating the questions yourself, simply by taking the objectives from the chapter 
or the chapter headings and just flipping the language around, turning them into questions. These questions will help you organize your reading because your mind will be considering how to answer each question as you read and it will help keep you engaged. Now during the reading, we just talked about note taking as being part of this active intelligent reading. So during the reading process, you should be taking notes. I encourage you to do that, of course, on your notebook paper, but if you are someone who does like to write in your textbook, be sure to write with your pen in your hand. You may be underlining important things or circling things, whatever your style might be in note taking in the textbook. And you also may be noting questions that you have, things that are unclear, that you want to either ask a classmate on a discussion board or email your instructor to discuss. So these during reading things are important. The final thing that you'll be doing is, of course, an after reading activity. And as we mentioned with the Cornell notes or whatever style of note taking you are using, after reading each day, you should set aside that extra little five minutes or so to go back and review what you have written. Now this is kind of a corny image to put with it, but I hope it helps you remember it. It's simply a sandwich, but think about a sandwich. They're sandwiched between the two pieces of bread. There in the middle is all that active reading that you've done. The bread on top is sort of your before reading activities. The bread on the bottom is what you're doing after reading. But the meat of what goes on is that during reading, note taking, question asking and answering, and all those active reading strategies that you're using. So that third strategy of active reading is really important. The fourth strategy really follows, I guess, really closely in, and the title is Close Reading. And it simply lists some things that are um, probably common sense in many ways, but are extremely important. History texts need really close attention. Think about it. Reading history is not like watching the History Channel. The History Channel gives you everything sort of pre-digested and it fits within an hour very neatly. Reading the material is a little bit different. You need to read it slowly, sentence by sentence, and always be thinking about the fact that you're trying to recover the sense of authors and information that happened before our time. Many of these things were written in a different time frame, and you need to be thinking about where were these people at when they were writing this information? What event or setting are they writing out of? And sort of make it your job to figure out these things. I've made a note here that you want to set aside time to read. Let me talk to you a minute about time. When you're reading history, or any class for that matter, it can be really useful for you to determine how much time you're going to need to read the assignment. So let's imagine that the chapter you have to read for history this week is 50 pages long, and you see it in the syllabus that you have this assignment, and by Friday, you need these 50 pages read. In order to really accurately determine how much time you're gonna need, I often encourage students to do just a little test with themselves, to um, set aside a little block of time, get out your textbook, and then either using your smartphone or your watch or your microwave timer, whatever you have available to you, set a timer for a specific amount of time, something short, like five minutes. Set the timer for five minutes and then highlighting, reading, um, all the things that you typically do while that timer ticks down that five minutes. When the timer goes off and the set amount of time is over for however much time you set that for, five minutes or whatever, Look at how much information you've read. So let's just say in that five minutes you read five pages, right? If that's the case and you know you have 50 pages to read, just sit down and kind of do the math and go, well, if it takes me five minutes to read five pages and I have 50 pages to read, I'm going to need X amount of time to finish this assignment. Um, Number one, it's useful because it helps you um, from underestimating, and that's typically what we do. We kind of leave you know, a short amount of time to read and we're rushed and we're, we're leaving for an event or we're gonna go pick up the kids at school and we have you know, 15 minutes and we think we're gonna sit down and blow through a chapter when really we need an hour. So if you can do this little test with yourself early in the semester so that you know how much time to adequately and accurately set aside for yourself, you're going to find that you're not going to feel that pinch at the end of each week or right before you have to respond to a discussion board conversation or take an online quiz. So be sure to take that time to figure out the time that you're going to need to do this. So that's a really good tip for you. The other things on this slide are pretty common sense. You know, read with a dictionary nearby because you probably will run across words that are unfamiliar or are used in an unfamiliar way. So be sure to look them up. 
I typically like to write the definition down in the margin of my book because just writing it helps me remember it. Of course, read with your notebook and your pen right there so that you can highlight and, and take notes as you go. And be sure that you have a willingness to reread material. Um, oftentimes we like to think if we can just breeze through it once we're good, don't be afraid to go back and reread. And I'm going to touch on this again in a second. And the other important thing is sometimes it's good to try a, a little bit of a different strategy. And the one I typically use for myself is reading difficult portions aloud. If you get to a paragraph or a section that you find is just really tricky and it's tripping you up, read it out loud. And if you find that you're growing sleepy, not only should you read out loud, but maybe stand up with the book and walk as you read for a short time. And these close reading tips will help you as you read through your history textbook. The fifth key is kind of interesting, and it kind of goes along with that rereading that I just mentioned. And it is this idea of selective reading. Um, and this is really important, I think, because oftentimes we are hesitant to reread entire chapters because, number one, we don't have the time to reread entire chapters. But selectively rereading portions can be a really good strategy to help you remember information and to fully understand it. It's also a really good real world skill because throughout your life you're going to find things that come your way that you have to read that are complicated. Things like um, cell phone uh, contracts and sometimes information that comes with credit cards is extremely difficult to understand and rereading portions of it can help with our understanding. So this key, although it is brief, the selective reading, key number five is important. So when you go back to reread, remember reread those portions that you found to be extremely difficult. The sixth key is one that a history instructor actually shared um, from experience in classrooms. And he made the comment that history is full of surprises and that as readers, we need to expect those surprises. Sometimes as students in history, um, we are confronted with information that contradicts things that we perhaps have believed prior to this time or things that we have read that contradict with what we're reading in the history textbook. Interestingly enough, history instructors often find that when students find contradictory information, they sort of push it away and ignore that and read on trying to find things that sort of match with what they know. Understand that history is not going to be just this smooth, easy narrative. It's going to be a bit complicated, and when you find these contradictions, instead of trying to push them away, bring them to the surface. Pay closer attention to them and begin to, as you're reading and reading multiple texts and other articles that your instructors give you, begin to try to make sense of why there may be differing points of view or differing opinions about these historical events. You also have to think about the perspectives that these things were written from. And this is where we get into our final seventh key to reading history. And it's all about interpretation. Um, you'll notice I just used the image of the cloud simply because as kids we used to you know, lay outside and look up at the sky and, and imagine what shapes we might be seeing. And what was interesting is you could be there with two or three friends looking at the same cloud and we would all see something different. History is sometimes this way. History is interpretive. The accounts that you will be reading, not only in your history book, but in some of the historical documents that you will be reading, are things that are open to interpretation because they come from multiple perspectives. Much of what you read is the, is the result of these intelligent writers trying to make sense of things that happened in the past. Here's what's really interesting. Some experts in the field, again, these historians that sort of have given some of these inside scoops, they share that there's three unique things that historians actually consider while they're reading history. And the three things are source, and that means, you know, where did this information come from? I know in your history textbooks you're going to be reading some um, original documents that are um, copied into your textbook. As you're reading those original documents, you really need to be thinking, who was this person that wrote this? What was the setting? that they were in. You know, were they writing this from jail? Were they writing this from um, a battlefield? Were they writing this as a casual observer off on the side? Who were they? Where were they? Think about the source of the information that you're reading and that will help you understand it. Also, contextualize it. Now that's a big word, but it simply means putting something in the place where it was written. Again, if you're writing a letter from jail, it's going to look very different than a letter you're writing um, from your couch in front of the fireplace, right? So thinking about the context 
from this information is going to be really important. And the last one was a huge word, it was corroborate, but it literally means how things work together. So when you're reading historical texts, figure out how the information fits together, even when it seems to conflict, because you may be thinking, okay, based on the source or the author or the setting, I can see how these differing points of view are working together to give me a more complete picture of what history is all about. Students, when they're reading these things, often just are reading for, you know, we want those facts and dates, right? What's going to be on the quiz? But we need to be thinking of this bigger picture. Um, being aware of the author and the setting and all these things are really important. And as you look at these things, you might find um, that you develop some questions about history. And that's where we get to um, this idea of what I want you to take away from this today. These are simple. Be an active reader. You know, be engaged with your text. Familiarize yourself with the textbook itself, what's available to you in the book to help you understand and make sense of the readings. Be sure that you've set aside adequate time each week to read, and then don't be afraid to read and reread and ask questions or get help if necessary.